From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Open Line. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Good show tonight. We are talking about something that we don't often talk about. What is happening inside our prisons? And we are talking with two people who are fighting for prison reform. Why is this important? What is actually happening in, in, in their point of view, in our public prisons and our private prisons? Happy to have with us two people who can answer those questions. Reverend Jeannie Alexander, she's director of No Exceptions Prison Collecti Co Collective, right? Yeah. Thank you for being here. Alex Friedman, one of the foremost experts on private prisons, also associate director of HRDC and managing editor of Prison Legal News. We'll, dis we'll, we'll let people know what HRDC is, but thank you for being here, Alex. Very Freeman. glad to be here. So, why is this an important topic? Why do we need to talk about it, Jeannie? Well, I think first and foremost, it's an important topic because we're talking about humans. <laughs> I mean, we are talking about people, and, um, and we're talking about people <laughs> for whom can, um, any sort of freedom has been eliminated. There is a government agency with complete control over their person. So that's 30,000 human lives in Tennessee. We're talking about 30,000 people in Tennessee. Right, and these are people's husbands and wives and sons and mothers and brothers. So, you know, if we've got 30,000 prisoners in this state, there are at least 200,000 people who do care about what happens to them. Your background is you're, you were a chaplain inside a prison. Mm -hmm. Is that what brought you to this? Mm -hmm. um, what you saw, yeah. or, or kind of what, what did bring you to this point? Um, well, it is just that, you know, because I do come at this very much from a faith perspective. So what my faith teaches me is that you can't bear witness to something that is wrong and then do nothing, because doing nothing is still a choice, and you've chosen to allow um, harm to continue. And so if I have abilities and gifts and a way to affect change, then it's incumbent to do that. Um, now on the other yeah. side, people commit a crime, um, they shouldn't be out in society. I mean, so what, what I guess, what, what is the line? Where, where are we making, um, where are we going too far? Right. Because you're not saying that certain people should not be behind bars, mm -hmm. right? Or I guess, what are you saying here? For those who are questioning, okay, you know, they've, they've committed a crime, they, they have foregone many of their rights, you know, what, what, what do you say to that, to those to people saying that? Sure, Ben, I mean, of course, that's the obvious question, right? So, what I would say to that is, no, we aren't saying that there is no need for social segregation, right? At least for a certain time period. But it's interesting, so, what is the goal of prison? You know, what is the purpose of our legal system? Why do we have a system of laws um, rather than simply a system of vengeance? Right? There's a reason why. Um, so, for example, victims don't choose the punishment because we understand that the kind of pain that can be caused um, is incredibly difficult to repair. And, and we would argue within our system, as opposed to a restorative system, sometimes it can seem impossible. So we have to balance that for the common good and say, are we, do we simply want to lock millions of Americans up forever? And in a country that should still, we hope still cares about redemption and the ability to restore communities, that can't be the answer. So then punishment should have an end. In the meantime, how do we want to treat people who are incarcerated? Do we want people to leave in a better position than when they went in? Right, because do we want them to contribute to our communities again? Do we want them to be taxpayers? Do we want them to take responsibility for their families? Do we want to understand why they committed crimes to begin with? So what's really in the best interest for the common good? Where are we missing the boat, in your opinion, Alex? Where, where are we not um, doing what Jeannie's talking about there? Um, where, where, where are we most off base? Well, I think primarily is that we use incarceration as the first line of punishment. We don't think people are being punished for committing crimes unless they're sitting in a cell for 10 or 20 years. Um, you know, people need to realize first that of the 2.3 million people we've locked up, which is more than any other country on the planet, 
um, the vast majority of those people are not in there for you know the big violent crimes that we tend to think of that are sensationalized uh, primarily by the mainstream media. So murder, rape, robbery, you know, those are actually the least common crimes. Most people are locked up for drug-related offenses, alcohol-related offenses, and property crimes, theft primarily. Um, so, you know, it's nice to say, well, yeah, people commit crimes and they need to be punished, but there's a lot of alternatives to incarceration that we could do. Community service work, probation, GPS electronic monitoring, day fines, split confinement, shock incarceration, um, you know, victim offender reconciliation or VORP programs. Um, you know, plenty of stuff we could do that other countries are also doing, or, or some, you know, drug courts, veterans courts, mental health courts. All of these are designed to really address some of these core issues that lead people to commit the offenses they do. But although we have some of those, we don't really use them a lot. Incarceration is our frontline defense. It's also the most expensive. It costs on average over $30,000 a year to lock somebody up, even if that person committed murder or whether they cashed a bad check. Either way, it's still costing the same amount, at least $30,000 know, per inmate per year. Uh, and this amounts to over $80 billion a year. Now, this is a zero-sum game. That's $80 billion we're not spending on take your pick, health care, better roads, better education, so on. So it costs us a bunch of money. It is a miserable failure because we have recidivism rates of upward of 70% over a five-year period after release. Those are the latest statistics. So if you had a company making cars and seven out of every 10 cars had to go back to the factory because you know, it didn't work right, nobody would buy cars from that company. It would go out of business. But that is the failure rate of our criminal justice system when we keep doing what we've been doing for the last couple hundred years. How optimistic are you that we'll change it? I'm not an optimist, I'll tell you that right now, because <laughs> I'm a realist. And realistically, uh, the forces that are in play that result in the criminal justice system we have are not so much social and not really economic. They're more political, right? It is incredibly... Um, easy to get voted out of office if you are soft on crime or perceived as being soft on crime. So for that reason, politicians for decades have been trying to outdo themselves on how they can be harsher on crime. And in some cases, not really on crime, but on prisoners. And there's a difference. People who have already committed crimes, been convicted and locked up, are no longer committing crimes. They're sitting in prison. And yet, the mentality is they need to be punished even more. Um, Prison is supposed to be the punishment. Being separated from your family, being locked in cells for years or decades, you know, that is the punishment. Uh, we don't follow the, the really retributive you know, regimes of torturing people, at least in theory, um, you know, and, and you know, beating them and abusing them and raping them while they're locked up um, to make their lives even more difficult. And I think we understand as a civilized nation that's not what you do. But people have this notion that prisoners being in prison just isn't enough. They need to be punished more. And I would submit that that's a large part of the problem, both from policy and lawmakers, all the way down to citizens who really don't have an idea of how our prisons actually work, what happens in them, because they've never been in one. They've never seen the inside of a prison, except on TV shows like Oz or Orange is the New Black, which are, of course, fictional portrayals. And and so you're not optimistic. If I ask you why should people care, one thing you would say is, well, the money. You know, it, it affects all of us with the money. It, what else? What, I mean, if there's somebody out there mm -hmm. who, who is thinking, this doesn't affect me, somebody commits a crime, you know, they should be punished. Right. How, does, how does our current system affect them? Okay. Well, first, just to be clear, we are not abolitionists. You know, nobody in our organization is saying, close all the prisons, free everybody, and let them go. You know, having been in prison myself, I served 10 years behind bars in Tennessee prisons and jails. Um, certainly there are some people who need to be locked up, and at one point I was one of those people. Um, but it is true that people change over time, and that once people are released, a lot of them don't go back to prison and they don't continue committing crimes. So why should people care? A couple reasons. One, yes, the economics, but that's just money, really. You know, and you know, money can be spent and saved ad nauseum. Uh, but the other thing is, those 2.3 million people locked up, 95% of them will one day not be locked up. They will be returning to our communities. So the vast majority of prisoners are going to be released, and they will become our neighbors and members of our communities again. The question is, what kind of neighbors do we want? Do we want people who have been in prison where we have abused them, removed all responsibility from their lives, you know, beaten them down, 
and then release them with $50 and a bus ticket to go back to their, their hometown? Or do we want to have given them the opportunities, resources, programs, and services so they can rehabilitate themselves? It's a self-rehabilitation process so that when they get out, they're better prepared and will not hopefully go back to doing the same things with either their substance abuse issues, alcohol abuse, mental health issues, and so on. So, you know, as Jeannie said, what's the goal of our justice system? Do we want to just make life miserable or do we want to help people so when they get out there will be less crime and less victimization in our communities? And if that's the goal, then we are, fa we are failing miserably at it. And we need to revise and revamp how our prison system works to ensure when people get out, they are less likely to come back. All right, we're going to take a break. Then we'll come back. We'll open up the phone lines. There's the number, 615-737-PLUS, 615-737-7587. And also, drill, I want to drill down into uh, the big problems within our prison system currently. So we'll drill down into that. We'll take a break. Be back right after this.